Streets of Fire is a 1984 American neo-noir rock musical directed by Walter Hill, starring Michael Pere, Diane Lane, Rick Moranis, and Amy Madigan. I'll be coming for her, and I'll be coming for you, too. Sure you will, and I'll be waiting. You are about to enter a world unlike any you've ever seen before, where rock and roll is king. The only law is a loaded gun. Where the beautiful... Stay and see the show, it's really good. The brutal... I want Tom Cody. ...and the brave all meet. From now on, it's for real. In Streets of Fire. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm John, the host, and tonight we travel back to 1984 to talk about a very special film directed by Walter Hill that's Streets of Fire, a rock and roll fable. Tonight I am joined once again by the very informative Mr. Dana Roach. Thank you for coming back on the show, sir. Thanks a lot for having me back on, John. I appreciate it. I, this is one of my favorite movies, and I'm excited to talk about it. This was a film that, you know, I asked you because I wanted you back on, on the show because we had so much fun doing 500 Days of Summer with Zach Taylor. Um, so go watch that episode, please. Yes. Because it was a lot of fun. But I asked you, you know, I, I wanted you back on. I'm just like, what, what movie do you want to talk about? And you said this was like, you didn't even give me a list at first. You're like Streets of Fire. <laughs> like it is. It's Streets of Fire. And that, that's it, full stop. And I'm just like, oh, crap, I, I don't even think I've heard of this. And, you know, we talked about this a little off air, and I was, like, going back through it. And when I was watching it the other night, I realized that I've seen bits and pieces of this movie over the span of, like, two decades, almost three decades. But I never sat and watched this thing. It was, like, always one of those movies that was on in the background. Yeah, that's very much the same experience for myself. Um, you know, as a kid, it was just always on HBO. Like, I don't know if I ever sat down and intentionally watched it front to back. I just saw, you know, half hour wedges of it 50 different times when I was, you know, 10 years old. What finally, like, stuck out to you where you're just like, okay, I want to put these pieces together. I'm going to sit down and watch it. And, and as you stated, this has become, like, one of your favorite films of all time. So it was probably in my mid twenties when, and and at that point in time, I I'm, I'm better versed in film and in movies, and and I remembered this movie from my childhood, and so I went back and and rewatched it for the first time. Then you know, at that point in time, having saw different bits and pieces of it over the years, for some reason I just wanted to go back and watch it, and upon rewatching it, I realized how much of the things I like about music in particular are defined entirely by this movie. <laughs> um, I, I love the ridiculous, bombastic rock songs like we get here. Um, Jim Steinman wrote the, the opening and closing musical numbers, which are these insane Wagnerian rock opera pieces. Sure. I, to this day, love the music. I have, I, I even brought it down here for the show. I have Jim Steinman's solo album yes. on vinyl, this ridiculous album. <laughs> um, but like, it, it's it's a movie written for 14 year olds with, you know, rock stars and pretty girls. And, and the entire movie takes place beneath the elevated train somehow in Chicago. And there's, you know, insane rock songs and cool cars. It's it's the id of a kid just going through puberty. <laughs> in a very specific time. Yeah, right, right, exactly. At that point in time in 1984. Right. <laughs> well, before we get too far ahead, introduce what we're, because uh, we have some really nice, I, I'll say Streets of Fire themed brews to go along with this uh, this particular show. Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off. I have a day flying coconut IPA from Fremont Brewing. This is from up here in Seattle, Washington. This is a seven percenter. And yes, you heard it right. Coconut IPA. And it's, I mean, what's more rock and roll than a wizard with riding a moth? I mean, this thing looks like it should be on the side of a of an odyssey. Uh, Very so nice. I, I, I've never, I've never, uh, it's never touched my palate. So I poured it uh, poorly, as you could see. What do you have? What's your Streets of Rage uh, themed <laughs> brew tonight? I have uh, Deschutes, which is from John's Neck of the Woods. Actually, it's in Portland, Oregon, so yeah. not too far away. Um, this is a fresh squeezed old fashioned. So it's an old fashioned flavored beer. That's incredible. Uh, it, we are reviewing an old-fashioned movie, so Dana, there we go. Yeah, I am to life. 
So to talk about this is a self-described rock and roll fable, and to let's start at the beginning because the beginning starts with Walter Hill. I I believe, and you know I I like to talk about filmmakers, and and I do so quite a bit with uh, our mutual friend Jason Alt on on our, my other podcasts uh, that I that I co-host in uh, uh, Film Hooligans. Walter Hill is I I believe one of, like just going through his past filmography is one of the most under-talked about and underrated filmmakers of a specific time and era. I, I think it's his style doesn't really translate so well maybe to today's standards, but I think for a very specific time, this is the filmmaker that is responsible for like the 48-hour franchise, which was a huge hit, and The Warriors, which, I mean, once you, you realize that Walter Hill directed The Warriors, this this movie in Streets of Fire makes a lot of sense. Yeah, spiritually speaking, it's very much kind of the descendant of that movie where it takes place not quite in our reality, just this slightly removed music video world to a degree. I agree that about, about Hill for sure. He's a really interesting filmmaker. Um, I think the last movie of his I watched as an adult was Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis, okay. which we're, you know, we're talking 25 years ago now. Um, but I went to see that in the theater by, by myself, I think, as like a 17 or 18 year old, um, specifically based on the fact that I liked the Warriors so much and Streets of Fire en enough that I that I wanted to go see that and that itself that's also kind of a removed from reality altered reality kind of movie as well. It seems like it be it could be set in the same universe almost. Yeah, right. It has like those those different gangs because you know you have the the gangs in in the the bombers that's the the main antagonist. Uh, you know, rival gang that uh, is is kind of threatening uh, Tom Cody's character and, and what's going on in, in that area. But you also have like he run he has like the run in with like the yuppie white dude gang that is like bad at switchblades that he just literally like slaps around. So it does have that like little faction esque. He has a style of filmmaking that he actually coined back then. I was watching some kind of behind the scenes about this. It's called he they called it uh, exaggerated realism. And it, it is. It, this feels like it doesn't feel like so much like a superhero movie. Like it all still feels grounded in reality to a point, but it feels like you're dreaming about reality. Yeah, and, and there's definitely also kind of a remix quality. I feel like to it too, where he just takes what he wants from different eras. The movie simultaneously takes place in 1954 and 1984. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 but it makes sense. No one comments on it. It's just in that world. Every car was built in 1954, but the music was all recorded in 84. And the you know there's neon 1984 lights everywhere. Yeah. Um, it, it's just this hodgepodge of things that Walter Hill likes and thought were cool, and he just they're they're all in like this one world. Yeah, and you don't really see a lot of filmmakers even attempt something like that because I no. mean you get a lot of like I, I think the the closest comparison you could do is like the fallout video game series where it's just like you know the bomb went off in the in the 20s or something and then now you have like pseudo futuristic things but the technology stopped at a certain point too but you know that's not it's not like a trope where a lot of filmmakers just kind of throw darts on the wall and be like okay i, I want to mix up the 70s with the 90s or right. you know the the 2000s with the 40s they go together so well like and you wouldn't think that it's like oh the 50s and and the 80s they had a lot of similarities with just kind of like the social unrest and the 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 factioning off and stuff like that i i really think that the choice of aesthetic for this particular film like worked really well yeah, I completely agree. And it's it's a unique thing. Don't really do that, but that gives it this this ethereal, otherworldly, out of time place. I mean, it definitely feels like an '80s movie, but it doesn't feel like uh, in, in a bad way. It feels like it's an '80s movie that has a kind of a strange, timeless vibe to it because of that. Yeah, yeah. And so let's talk about this. But this was budgeted at fourteen. Five million, you know, it, it had that's a decent budget for 1984. Yeah. Like I said, he did make he did prove himself with 48 hours, and you know, the Warriors came out in '79, so they, they gave him some money to make this film, especially uh, something as kind of off the wall as, as this idea. But it only made 8.1 million on a return, and that's you know, if you put in perspective 
uh, a filmmaker that was hot at the time, coming off those two films, and with this kind of cast. Like, I pray probably wasn't like a huge household name back then, but Diane Lane, uh, I think she was just coming off something huge, even though she was only mm-hmm. 19 years old when they made this film. You know, Rick Moranis, it, it just seemed like there was a lot of reasons for people to show up to this. Why do you think it, it was kind of a financial failure? Um, I don't know. You know, I, 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 having not been around then, I don't know how it was marketed. It's, it, it is a difficult movie, I think, maybe to pitch to an 80s audience. Um, the, your hero's kind of a jerk. And I think, <laughs> in, 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 and I think in the 80s, I think you're, they were looking for that, that all American, Reaganite, you know, sure. upstanding citizen kind of superhero character, and I don't think this did that. That he he's an outcast. He's it's hinted at that he was a criminal in the past. He's left the army now, but it's not like he's left the army as a hero. He's just kind of bumming around trying to find the next thing. Just the um, war ended. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very he's he's a very disaffected character. I can see how that aspect of it absolutely did not play to the, a country that just recently re- reelected Ronald Reagan for the second time. What is Streets of Fire about? There's a, a rock singer played by Diane Lane who is kidnapped by a group of bikers and and taken across town to the the rough part of town that's the battery, in, the battery which is entirely factories that manufacture steam, as far as I could tell. <laughs> um, and her ex boyfriend uh, Michael Perret, the main character, gets telegraphed to to come rescue her. <laughs> so he comes back into town. Uh, his sister contacts him, who still lives there, and he is hired by her manager to journey to this the battery and bring her back safe and sound. And along the way, collect a motley group of assorted sidekicks and heroes. The, the plot kind of mirrors Conan the Barbarian in a lot of ways, where he's sure. like building this crew as he goes and comes back on this journey. I, you know, I got huge Super Mario Brothers vibes, and I'm not sure, just talking about yeah. the movie, but just the general, like, what's, you know, if you were to say, what's Super Mario Brothers about? Well, you know, you have these guys, and then someone, you know, this this antagonist steals the princess, puts her in the castle, and then, you know, these people have to go get her, this motley crew. There was a lot of this going on. You know, you could just, like... It's, rattle off 20 different iterations of you know bad guy steals girl uh good guys have to go get girl uh but i think that this was this was set apart from a lot of those because of the diversity of the characters like you said tom Mm -hmm. cody kind of kind of a dick i mean he's a dick with a heart of gold right like he's he's got that he means well and michael perret is just like he's a tough guy he just looks like a tough guy and maybe you know sylvester stallone was already kind of uh, occupying that same space and maybe he kind of, you know, when they both went to casting calls or something like that, th- there just was so many, so much of that to go around with how big, you know, Schwarzenegger and all those were. Maybe there weren't so many roles. And he, I mean, if you close your eyes, he sounds like Sly. He yes. has like a real life, and that's his real voice. Yeah. So and, it, and he can, he can't be bothered to be polite even right. when it might make life easier. He just is who he is all the time. Yeah, I mean, he's got good intentions. He's trying, you know, he he doesn't, you know, yeah. we're going to get into spoilers. I mean, this movie came out in 1984. It's almost as old as I am. So, you know, spoilers abound, 35 years old movie. You know, go watch go watch it if you haven't. And if you, this is your final spoiler warning because, you know, spoilers throughout. Um, but, you know, he's the type of guy where he, he will knock out his girlfriend. He'll literally give her a right <laughs> hook to get her out of harm's way. So it's just like, yeah, he's this. He's this dummy with a heart of gold, but he's like a bull in a china shop also. Absolutely. Yeah, he um, is just chaos. Um, <laughs> well-meaning chaos, but yeah. absolutely chaos. I mean, the, you know, he his introduction, basically, he pulls up and, and walks into his sister's diner. And you mentioned the, the white guy gang that are bad at switchblades <laughs> that come in. Uh, he takes out like three windows disposing of those guys. <laughs> in his sister's diner, right? Like, yeah. like you, you know, you would think he would attempt to not bust up her place, but he makes no attempt to do so. And then steals a car, right? Then steals their car, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you see a movie like this, and you're like, man, I, this guy just doesn't look familiar at all. He's like a fresh face, and then you forget it's 35 years later. And you're just like, wow, Michael Perry really didn't do a lot of films. I'm. He was the most notable notable thing that I found that he was in. He played 
the old version of Josh Hartnett in The Virgin Suicides from Sofia Coppola. That's okay. That's Which trivia. That, I didn't even catch that, that was him. So <laughs> exactly. Thanks IMDb for that one. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's just one of those things. It's just like he he was just the perfect casting for this. It, it feels like he was the '80s version of like a a Thomas Jane or something. Yes. Oh, very much so. That that would absolutely be a Thomas Jane role today for sure. Going back to to Walter Hill a little bit. So he used to catch a lot of heat for being a little bit sexist. And, I, and I'm and i not going to give him a pass because, you know, you could say, oh, well, it was the time. You watch 48 hours. None of those jokes <laughs> you could you could get away with today. Sure. Like Nick Nolte calling Eddie Murphy a watermelon. And so it's just like, oh, my God, it's, it's very of its time. So I'm not going to give him a pass. But I do want to kind of applaud Walter Hill a little bit for some strong female characters in this because I absolutely love – Amy Madigan's character. She's just so cool in this role. I think as written, it was actually written for a guy. And she, if I remember correctly in doing some research, she read for the sister role of, of Riva mm. and instead decided she wanted to play the um, the sidekick McCoy. And and in talking to Walter Hill about it, she said, you don't have to change anything. It's the exact same character. And I said, well, okay. So that's where that came from. But yeah, she's, she's a... Um, has absolute, she steals the car at the end. Like yeah. she has agency. She makes her own yeah. choices, makes her own decisions. It's a completely like loveless, non-sexual role between her and, and Tom, which yeah. is great because they're just, they're just like found each other and they get each other because they're, their past experiences as soldiers. And, you know, it's, the same thing happened to her. It's just like, you know, I, I am now a soldier, but now the war is over. I, I don't have my place in the world. So that's why they kind of gravitated to each other and why it just like it's such like a, a sweet uh, friendship, but never, you know, sexual at all. And, and no. they very well could have like gone that way. They could have they could have just been like, oh, you know, he's not going to go with Diane Lane because now he's fallen in love with this this person. Or they could have just like way over tomboyed her out and like made her a right. lesbian or something, you know, and that would have been. I mean, that would have been fine, you know, make her whatever. But I think they found a perfect balance to, you know, feature her and, and give her some agency, like you said. Yeah. Well, another thing that was interesting, I, I remember as a kid when we actually get to the, the bar scene in the battery, there's a dancer slash mm -hmm. stripper there. And I remember as a kid being unsure of the gender of that dancer. Sure. And, yeah. and as an adult – still not being 100% sure until there's like one scene where you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure that's intended to be a woman. <laughs> yeah. But that's it's very vague. And I, I, I in rewatching it for this review, I was like, that's kind of cool that like this, that, that may well have been a, a guy dancing at this biker bar. Um, I don't think that was the intent, but it's pretty easy to read that way. And I, I thought that was a nice, interesting kind of weird twist. Yeah, and it was it was uh, French actress Maureen Jahan who was the dance slash bicycle double body double for Gen Jennifer Beals and Flashdance. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and I was I was a bit surprised that they they went for it with her dancing. Like, yeah, she was full like butt thong and like yeah. uh, even some nipple shot. And I'm like, this is PG, but you know, 1984 right. PG movies were quite different. <laughs> well, even Willem Dafoe is a little bit fluid yeah. in in what you're supposed to expect of him, god. which was interesting. He just, oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> Willem Dafoe, it, it, there was a very specific time when he played this role in multiple movies, because uh, he was in this time period, you know, he was in uh, Catherine Bigelow's uh, debut film, The Loveless, has like a, a head of a biker gang, Bobby Peru and Wild at Heart. He just knew how to do this so mm -hmm. well. And he just, he is the Tim Curry in this film, like, 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 you know, for Rocky Horror, like he stole Bet. every scene he was in. And is there a cooler bad guy name than Raven Shattuck? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. But uh, exactly what you said, like he has this like kind of tight, uh, almost like Hellraiser bondage looking get up. Yeah. And it's just, it, he just looks, but he looks so menacing. He has that, that get up, but at no point is that played as like a weakness, which is an would have been an easy thing in the eighties to do, yeah. was to like portray him as being a little feminine and make that be a sign of weakness. That's not the case at all. No, 
no, he's he's still Willem Dafoe. He's got that yeah. like crazy, I, and I mean Willem. I've said this in the past. He's just a vampire because Willem Dafoe was right. never <laughs> old and he was never young. <laughs> he's like a Paul Rudd. They just yes. for whatever reason they just don't age at all. And he, yeah, he looks just. I mean, if you told me this movie came out last week, I'm like, oh yeah, Willem Dafoe. Yeah, he looks the same. Yeah, that's what the he same. looks like. Yeah. <laughs> but like. The beginning scene, uh, or the introduction to the bombers, is one of the coolest unveilings of uh, of like an antagonist ever. Because it's during Diane Lane's big music number, and goddamn, that thing is an earwig. It's still in my stuck in my head. Get the the inner cuts of the motorcycle game coming, but there's no reveal of their face or anything. They're too far away, and then the door opens, and they're just completely shrouded in shadow until like the the song goes off, and then like he. It's like a fade into his face. Oh, my God. It's, it's a super villain reveal. Very yeah. much so. Yeah, it's great. Even like the choice of weapons at the very end for the final <laughs> confrontation is some insane super villain stuff. Oh, totally. That that part, although pretty rad, kind of made me like it, it just reminded me of the, the baseball bat scene in the Warriors. Sure. Sure. A, a sure. Little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the only time I've seen a sledgehammer fight in a movie. Yeah. And I mean, that's. Tom Cody is, is a big buff dude, uh, so I, I I got that. But, I mean, Willem Dafoe was swinging that thing like yeah, he made a yeah, spaghetti. Yeah. While, while wearing what appeared to be leather hip waders. Oh, so good. Only, only <laughs> Willem Dafoe, man. Yep. All... <laughs> and he pulled it off. It's a look, and he pulled it off. <laughs> Hill wanted to make, uh, even back then, he wanted to make like a, the character of Tom Cody as like the front man to a superhero film franchise like he wanted to do a couple films featuring this character of tom cody um he didn't like at walter hill didn't like any existing comic book so he didn't want to you know just like make a punisher movie or whatever I, I like that he did that because it looks like you know in this film itself it's it's a self-contained good movie like you could just mm -hmm. watch streets of fire and be satisfied it's just got everything in it it's a you know quick 90 minutes and you're done and, and you're you're going to have a good time but you could see that they were kind of holding back a little bit C character bio and stuff like that like everything that would be revealed in like a sequel but i right. I, I love the fact that he made this character from scratch like sam raimi did with dark man yeah, he, he's very much a character for you as the audience, being presumably a 14-year-old boy in the, the 80s, to project what you kind of view as this this non-superhero superhero onto. I, I never felt like, as a kid, Rambo... Like, I, I enjoyed the Rambo movies, where I enjoyed Schwarzenegger doing a Schwarzenegger thing, but but there was never any part of me that, like, wanted to be that. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to have a stubbly beard and wear a cool trench coat and drive that sweet car. Like, there's elements of of, of Tom Cody that are easy to project yourself on, as a kid onto in a way that you kind of couldn't with the 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 big names we just named from the '80s and in, in, in their giant genre movies. Oh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. And and as much. Uh, praise that I gave Walter Hill for the for Amy Madigan's betrayal um, of McCoy. I I want to give I I got to give a little shit to Diane Lane's character and not not her fault. I think she right. did really well. Like she again, nineteen years old, she betrayed like what it is to be a female rock star or rock star in general, like perfectly. Like she just has that demeanor about her. Her yep. performances on stage were just so commanding. Like you can't mm -hmm. look away. She's not even singing. Like those are lip syncing pieces. Right. She just, she was such a commanding presence on stage. Once she gets off stage, I, I did. I, I thought they, they completely devoid. She was devoid of agency because she was like, Oh, you know, I'm just going to go with this, you know, with Rick Moranis, you with Tommy Fish, because, you know, I, I kind of have to for my career. I, but then as soon as my ex-boyfriend that's like hunkier comes back, I'm going to, you know, leave this situation. With that. I, I don't I don't like how weak her character is. She's very much a plot element more so than she is an actual character. Mm -hmm. She's she's a kind of a MacGuffin in a way. She's what's required to move everyone from point A to point B. And there's almost nothing in the writing to give her any personality agency anything like she's absolutely given nothing to work with other than when she's on stage diane lane 
has a ton of presence up there yeah. with no lines. So she does what she ha- what she can with what she has, but at the other points of the movie, there's nothing there for her to work with really at all. Yeah, and I think the, those times where she got to shine, like those stage performances, she probably was just like super pumped for because that was like a powerful scene or in all sure. the scenes that she got to do. Um, and, and that's what's so cool about this film and makes it different. It, it is a... I would say it is a rock musical or a rock opera, but it's not in the sense where people for no reason at all just start singing at each other. Right. And it's not like out of place like that. It's just, it it completely makes sense. Anytime there's music, it makes sense in the context of, of what's going on. Like, Oh my God, the scenes and torchies, like we mentioned with just that dancing and, uh, and the incredible, that band, fucking yeah. nails it like they're, yeah, they're, they're so great. good and it's so cool because it's like it, that whole like that music and that dancing it has this cadence to it where every it's kind of like ticking up the tension and everyone's just kind of on edge except when it like you know tom starts like blowing up motorcycles and then it like comes to a head and the the two people that are like the coolest ice water veins that have this like been there before attitude is, is tom and raven when they face off for the first time with, you know, things exploding around them, yeah. and it, it's what a perfect setup. Because like everything else in the movie, it, it, it's just to the extreme, you know, somehow the entire city is beneath the elevated train in Chicago. Right. Somehow it just rained 10 minutes earlier. Somehow... <laughs> Every bullet that hits a thing makes that thing explode. <laughs> but it's but it's a great. It's it's not like one of those things where it's annoying or insulting. It's part of that world. It's so stylized that it makes sense, and you just go with it. Of course, every every shotgun pellet coming out of that twelve gauge makes things explode in a giant ball of fire because right. that's what that would happen. What would do in that world? It's like a Michael Bay film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, but but in a way more fun. Like yeah. I, I think the Bay movies a lot of times lack a sense of joy, and this is a jo- like this is a fun movie. This is everything about it is designed to be joyful. Yes, yes, it's loud, but it has a purpose. Like it, mm-hmm. it's going to a rock concert. This is pumping your fist the entire time because yes. you're actually rooting for humans. You're rooting mm-hmm. for these characters, um, unlike Michael Bay film where you're just sitting there watching fireworks go off right. with a with some chick in a bra, and it's just right. like, ah, oh, god, this is so vapid. Can we talk about Tommy Fish real quick? Because the, like the opposite thing happened where he's just like. You know, Walter Hill's just like Diane Lane. She's going to be this huge presence, and she turns out to be kind of an empty character. Tommy Fish has a lot of depth. And, I mean, you know, of course, Rick Moranis is just a, a, a wizard. Like, he is yes. just a, a fantastic actor. But, like, he's he, he's made to be, like, the un- unlikable, you know, rich manager. But, like, is he ever wrong? Is he ever no. not doing the right thing? Like- he's super practical the whole movie. <laughs> um, and he's – and even at the end – when, you know, he thinks she's going to leave with Cody, he's like, well, that's what's going to happen. Okay. I'll she, step out she, of the she, way. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. He is, adds way more characterization than that character, especially again in the eighties where that could have been, you know, the awful yuppie manager. Yeah. Um, he adds a lot to that. Number one, just by being Rick Moranis, I think right. he adds humanity to anything he does. Um, but number two, he he finds those depths in that character, the way he plays that role. And and unlike with with Diane Lane's character, <laughs> it's written in a way that there's actually something for him to do. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like there is like in any other film or in a lesser film, I would say that character doesn't go on the on the journey to go save the princess. He is funding yes. this thing. He is going to stay in his in his high castle and just be totally out of harm's way. But no, he he's there. He's he's in the he's in the shit with them. Um he's he walks right up to to Raven Shattuck at the end and he gets in their face and he's just like, "You know what? Get out of our town." Where he's he's like facing down, he's staring at down the proverbial barrel mm-hmm. of the entire, you know, bombers gang and he gets his teeth knocked out for it. But it's such but he does it like he's in a he stands up. He bet. stands up. I love that character. And I yeah. know that they're just like, ah, oh, we gotta make this the the slimy record guy. And it's like, no, this guy's awesome. Yeah. Well even, you know, Bill Paxton, yeah, in a real small role here, kind of does the same thing. He's <laughs> this kind of this this weird kind of wussy loudmouth bartender. He's playing a character not that different from Hicks and Aliens. Right. But at the end, he also stands up 
and yeah. so do the police that the police do as well, who are not fans of Cody's and don't see any particularly good guys throughout most of the movie. At the end, same thing. Like everyone kind of comes together in their own way at the end. Everyone kind of sticks to a certain code, right? Even the yeah. even the yes. bombers, like they, you know, Sh- Shattuck gets his ass handed to him, and what do they do? They don't they don't destroy the town. They put them back on, yeah. on one of the sidecars and they leave like quietly yeah. with their tail between their legs. They all kind of play within the rules of this universe really well. Yes. Which is fun, which I enjoy. That, that's such a weird, unique, different thing. Even the bad guys have their code and as messed up as it is, they follow it at the end. Let's, let's talk about some really cool side characters or some side actors in, in this. Like EJ Daly plays Baby Bird. She's just kind of that person to like be like, yeah, you told him Diane or not Diane, Lane, <laughs> right. whatever, Ellen, you know, yeah, you, you really gave it to him, Ellen, but she's the voice of Tommy Pickles, you know, from Rugrats fame, Buttercup from, from, uh, oh God, what are they called? I want to say the Spice Girls. I know it's not. It was not the Spice but I know what you mean. Powerpuff uh, Girls. Jesus. There we go. Yep. Yeah. And, and she was the voice of Babe Pig in the City. So she was, you know, uh, Ed Harris's wife. She's had a huge voice acting career after this. You mentioned Bill Paxton playing Bill Paxton. Like, this right. was just his role <laughs> yeah. and everything, which was great. Like, no one did it better because it was him. Uh, Lee Ving, who was like the second in command, to Raven Shattuck, he was, uh, he played Mr. Body in Clue. And he was also, in real life, the lead singer of the one of the founding punk bands in Fear. Terrible actor. Like, he's just, <laughs> he's awful. But uh, he was in some really cool cult movies and uh, also in a, in a cool band. Uh, yeah, so you had all these, it was like sprinkled in all these like rad ass members that you, you some of them blink and you miss it. Well, even, even the Shirelles, which is the, this 50 doo band they pick up along the way. Yeah. You have Robert Townsend into there. Yeah. Um, pretty well known comedian. I could tell Williamson who played Bubba in Forrest Gump. There's a third actor whose name escapes me, who was at the very least one of the, um, police lieutenants in Lethal Weapon 2 who gets killed when, when, when the bombers are setting off bombs and blowing up all the rest of the squad aside from Riggs and Murta. Yeah. He's one of like their buddy cops in there as well. Um, so like almost all of those guys are someone who's recognizable in like a one-line role. Ed Begley Jr. Yeah, Ed pops Be- up. Exactly. <laughs> just randomly with like four lines like this homeless guy they, they encounter in the battery. Oh, man. It, it, what, when you think back fondly on this film... What is like the one scene that really stuck out to you? The, the intro of Cody when he's he's fighting the guys with a switchblade. Him, <laughs> the guy pulls a switchblade. Cody slaps him, takes it away, does like the little switchblade move, hands it back to him. Right. Try again. <laughs> Try again. Slaps him and takes it away again. <laughs> That's such a cool move. Um, like as a kid, the the two like cool guy moves I recall are that one and in Big Trouble in Little China. When he catches the knife, the, the knife trick and throws it back at the end and kills Lil Pan. Great one too. I, those are the two like like cool guy tricks I, I remember as a kid that stand out at me. So that one um, definitely is a moment that that really stuck with me from when I was young for whatever reason. Sure. No, How about yourself? Absolutely. No. Yeah. Like I said, the. The introduction to the to the guy gang, you know, when he slaps him around, it turns into almost like an old school Bruce Lee film for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, and it's so good. Yep. Like I, I just love it. I, Again, when uh, the first interaction between Tom and uh, Raven, I just thought was so fucking money. Good guy meeting bad guy than most like westerns or superhero films that i've seen like the dialogue like the the i'll be coming for her and i'll be coming for you too and like and i'll be waiting (laughs) it's like that's very much a western standoff moment and what did raven say he's just like oh i'm glad that i finally found someone that likes to play as rough as i do yeah (laughs) yeah oh such a great moment money scene man you mentioned like liking the songs or getting them stuck in your head Mm -hmm. um that for me is also a big thing from this movie absolutely um Without even realizing it, you know, the, the opening and closing, there's like these long musical numbers um, that are both songs by Jim Steinman, mm-hmm. who wrote the first Meatloaf album, Bad Out of Hell, um, and then contributed a few songs over the years to Meatloaf. But it wasn't something I even was aware of at the time. But but those strong songs really stuck in my head. And then as I got older, for whatever reason, going back through old music, finding Bad Out of Hell as an album... 
I love that album. I love that first Meatloaf oh, yeah. album. Uh, unapologetically, it is 100% my jam. Yep. Um, and then, like, later in life, putting two and two together, Jim Simon wrote, wrote these songs. What else did he ever write? The two songs from Streets of Fire, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so, like, Nailed that it. kind of thing, that connection and how much... Um, and, and then I wonder well, how much of me liking Bad Out of Hell and liking that style of music is influenced by being 10 years old and seeing those Streets of Fire songs on HBO and hearing them. How much did that influence what I love in terms of music? And I think a lot. I think a lot of what I love about music and movies in general is influenced by this seeing this movie on HBO as a kid. It just had an effect on me, even if I wasn't really aware of it at the time. Man, a hundred percent. And I wish I would have actually seen this in its entirety, like throughout my life. So I would have these like fond memories uh, of it. And, and, you know, just cause it's one of those, it feels like, which is so weird because it's such an under talked about and underappreciated film, but it feels like one of those benchmark type films. Like this should have been, a Huge. like a like a rocky yeah. horror film right yeah like it, yeah this... um, yes it, it's it, it's curious that it didn't ever catch on as a cult movie as a rocky horror or as a repo man kind of movie it was a complete genre bender the fable it was a fairy tale it was this rockabilly movie it was a musical but not a not a traditional right. musical it did all these things so well and so uniquely that and then no one talked about it because right. even his own filmography was overshadowing this film. Like that, that's why it got overshadowed by his own stuff. And, and for, for whatever reason, other things that came out in 84, you know, this is, I think around this time, this is when people were really into like the, you know, horror w was pretty big and like yeah. sci-fi horror specifically and those, and just like, you know, big romantic comedies. So I think maybe that's why it got lost in the mix. But I, I know that it's finally kind of finding like life after, you know, its initial release. Like nowadays, uh, people are really starting to catch on. So Dana, if you could like shake the camera right now and like get people to like, why should people watch Streets of Fire? Um, it, it's, we mentioned this off the air. I think I described it as being a big Mac of a movie <laughs> and I think I called it critic proof as well. There's definitely things about the movie you can criticize, Yeah, but it's, but it's not trying to be a good movie. I think it, it's trying to be what it is. It's trying to be this ridiculous over the top movie filled with everything that you would have found cool as a 14 year old in the eighties. Yeah. Um, and it, and it accomplishes its goal as well as you possibly could have. It does all of those things as well as you could have. I, I think if you are a 19-year-old right now, I don't know how much it's going to resonate with you. Sure. It feels very much of a place. And I think you have to have have to be maybe a little bit older and 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 have some perspective of to, to look back on your youth. And I don't know if you can really do that and appreciate it if you're that age. Maybe you can. Um, I could be wrong there, but I but I definitely think if you are somebody who's getting a little bit of gray in your beard, um, <laughs> like these two the guys, kind of movie, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can definitely look back at and appreciate for all its faults. It's just an insanely ridiculously fun movie. Yeah, and and well made. And like you said, I, yeah. I'm not going to disagree. It does feel like a Big Mac. It, it's very it's full of excess. But it doesn't mean that it's 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 edited really well. Yeah. Um, it's it's perfectly paced, perfectly acted. Everyone gave a shit from the set designers to the script writers to the that. actors to the filmmaker himself. This thing was just aces across the board. Is it the best yep. movie of all time? No, but I would re I would definitely recommend this to anyone that that li that doesn't like musicals but likes music sure. and movies. Yeah, uh, like the crow. Like if you're a fan of the crow, this might be your shit. Like this, there's a, for sure some similar aesthetic there in terms of it being this one step removed from reality world. For sure, more well put together film than even the Warriors was because I think that yeah. the Warriors could get a little messy. You know, albeit it ha I think the Warriors has more uh, iconic scenes that people still talk about and that are you know just kind of jump out more. But f you know, for the most part. You know, I think it's the not Warriors, as quotable, I guess. You the know. Warriors is so over the top to yeah. that that it's a little bit easier to to classify it as being something that you can't judge on the same scale as you would something intentionally trying to be a serious movie. I think this one is just maybe a hair too close to reality, so it 
you can very easily just find the dialogue ringing false or things feeling false versus things being kind of this almost magical realism vibe. So I, I think that's part of it too. I, I think it's, it hews a little close to reality, maybe, but man, it's just so much fun. So much fun. hundred percent. Absolutely. I, man, I want to thank you once again. You're just, I love having you on Dana. Like it's, it's, no, it's but, always a blast having you on. Thank you so much. Look into that camera. Tell everyone what you're up to, <laughs> where to find you. Thanks again. Uh, I primarily make magic content. You can see me on the EDH Rec cast once a week. I'm also on a podcast called Commander Central talking about magic content there as well. Um, I write for EDH Rec, the website, so you can find me there. I'm pretty active on Twitter, at Dana Roach. And I'm just a movie nerd, so I watch John's show when I can. And I, I want to thank you for having me on. I love talking about movies like this. I don't get a lot of chance to do that hmm. uh, outside of doing this kind of thing with you. So whenever you want to have me on again, I will be glad to come on. This was a lot of fun. Just wrote me a blank check. That is to your detriment. <laughs> However, I will cash that. I am at John the Host if you want to follow me on Twitter. Or you could follow this very uh, podcast or video podcast at simply The Cult of Films. All under case. It made it very easy. I will be uploading this also to all of your favorite podcasting website so your spotify's itunes leave us switchblades or you know motorcycle <laughs> gangs or you know war hammers or whatever until next time do we have any cool streets of fire outro dana oh i didn't even think to come up with one <laughs> put me in the spot here no let me no one ever does this is my favorite <laughs> part of the show where i put the guest in a horrible situation i found a co-host uh, on the cult of films that likes to play as rough as I do. And we'll, we'll go. There we go. That. Nice. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Well, looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. <laughs> <laughs>